Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our Helpful Folk webinar. The subject of today's presentation is what's the right ISA for you? A topic very relevant for the start of the tax year as investors look around to ensure they're getting the best return on their money. Currently, some may be unhappy with the returns they're getting, particularly on their cash ISAs, whilst others might be concerned about the volatility of the stock market. So really, what are the options? I'm Nicola Holmes. I'm head of compliance at folk to folk and my focus is really looking out for the best interests of our investors. We're delighted today to welcome our expert speaker, Adam Deacon. He's a senior financial planner from Azets, and he's going to take us through the five different types of ISA to help us identify which ones might be right for us or right for you. So it's now over to Adam. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the presentation. So, firstly, today there's no real right answer as to what I, what ISA is the, the best for any one person. And um, so, we're going to take a look at uh, the, the various ISAs available, some of the benefits of each of them, some of the downsides as well. But first, a little bit about assets and assets financial planning. So we're independent financial planners or financial advisors, and we provide advice to individuals, families and businesses across the country. It's really varied advice from uh, pensions, investments, life insurance, but also for, for businesses looking at employee benefits, uh, as well as having a mortgage team. Um, so <clears throat> today's agenda, We'll first have a look at where ISA started and how they've developed over the years to give us a bit of background as to how we got to where we are today. We'll have a look at the features of the different ISAs that are available um, and uh, the, the pros and cons of each. And importantly, then some of the other considerations that, that you need to take when deciding what's right for yourself. So ISAs really began in 1987, but they weren't called ISAs. Uh, at the time, they were called personal equity plans, and these were really only available to hold either single uh, company shares or investment funds that you might be familiar with through stocks and shares ISAs today or even your own pensions. And at the time, the allowance was just shy of two and a half thousand pounds, so a long way from where it is today. In 1999, so just over 10 years since then, the PEPs were replaced by the maxi and mini ISAs and allowances were increased to £4,000 and £3,000 respectively. So maxi and mini not very descriptive as to what they are, but maxi were stocks and shares ISAs and mini were cash. So slightly different allowances for the two of those. And in 2006, those descriptions were scrapped uh, to the more familiar terms that we now have of, of cash and stocks and shares. And for the first time, we became able to actually transfer a cash ISA into a stocks and shares ISA, but not the other way around. Coming in then a few years later in 2011, we saw a replacement for the Child Trust Fund, um, and that's been called the Junior ISA. So this had its own allowance of £3,600 a year, and again, could be invested in cash or stocks and shares. In 2014 and spreading into 2015, ISA rules became a lot more flexible. So you're allowed to split your allowance between different types of ISAs. And now for the first time, you're actually able to move money from a stocks and shares ISA back into a cash ISA. And something that's still a little bit uh, unknown today even is that the rule came in to allow you to replace money that you've withdrawn from an ISA for the first time. So if you have your ISA today that you've put £20,000 into, whether it's cash or stocks and shares, and you need some access to that money, you can actually withdraw some of it. So let's say you take out £5,000. And so long as you put it back in in the same tax year, it doesn't use any more of your ISA allowance. So that's a really valuable benefit now of, of ISAs. In 2015, 
we saw for the first time the help to buy ISA. So this was aimed at helping first time uh, first time house buyers and the government was adding a 25 percent bonus uh, to the contributions, but only up to uh, contributions of, of four thousand pounds a year. The help to buy ISA, although it's still in existence now, has actually uh, is no longer available for, for new investors um, and existing investors can only contribute uh, contribute to that existing ISA, they can't make any other changes to it. And the following year, we saw the ISA allowance increased to £20,000. So over the space of about 30 years from the original PEPs to the ISAs as they were in 2016, the allowance had risen from £2,400 to £20,000 and it stayed at that level since. At the same time, in 2016, we saw the introduction of another ISA, this time the Innovative Finance ISA, or IF ISA. This is a completely new style of investment, and we're going to take a look at that a little later on in this, uh, in this session today. 2017, yet again, another ISA launched, this time to replace the Help to Buy ISA. We've seen the introduction of the Lifetime ISA. Took quite a long time for this ISA to get itself off the ground uh, and uh, again mainly for use of first time buyers but also for those who uh, have already got their got their first home therefore can't benefit from that as a secondary benefit of it being available for retirement but there's some really big restrictions on on how that lifetime ISA can be used and again we're going to discuss that a little later on. 2019 was the year that helped to buy ISAs officially closed. But as I mentioned, con contributions can continue to these until 2029. So that's a little bit of a brief recap of, of the, the history of ISAs and how we've got to where we are today. But you can see that the last sort of five years or so, there have been some quite, quite big changes to how ISAs work. And that's made it a little bit confusing for some, especially with different allowances available to, to some of the different isotypes that we've got available. But spread across ISAs as a whole, generally they all work in pretty much the same way. So the main benefits of an ISA, are that there's no personal tax on the income or gains that it makes. So any interest from a cash ISA is tax free, there's no limits on that. And for an invested ISA, there's also no tax on the capital gains that it makes. At the same time, that income doesn't need to be declared on your tax return either. So from an administrative point of view, ICE is a, a very easy place for you to hold your savings. Money can be withdrawn from an ISA at any time without losing the tax break, so you can withdraw the whole thing without uh, without any tax issues, you might have some penalties from your ISA provider, but there's no, no tax burdens for doing so. And as I mentioned earlier on, you can actually contribute that money back in during the same tax year without using your ISA allowance. And the allowance that I've already mentioned sits at £20,000, though it is lower for the lifetime ISA, helped by ISA and junior ISAs. So who's eligible? Overall, you need to be an individual resident in the UK to benefit from an ISA. You need to be over the age of 18, with the exception of 16 for a cash ISA. And to open a junior ISA for somebody under 16, you need to be their parent or legal guardian. So a grandparent can't open it, but a parent can. The grandparents can then contribute to it if they want to. Another area that a lot of people get caught up on or caught out on is opening uh, opening different ISAs and not, not being too sure of what they can and can't do. So you're able to hold up to one of each type of ISA and can actively contribute to them each year. So some people might split their £20,000 between a cash and stocks and shares ISA, for example. It's not £20,000 each, they could split it in any proportion. And again, if they're contributing to a lifetime ISA, that also contributes towards that £20,000 allowance. What you can't do 
is contribute to two different cash ISAs in the same tax year or two different lifetime ISAs or stocks and shares ISAs. You can only contribute to one of each kind. Now we talk about ISAs being very tax efficient, almost as tax efficient as pensions. The one tax that it does not avoid or help you with is inheritance tax. So on death, the value of an ISA will be included in your estate for inheritance tax. And it's really key to remember that. ISAs will also cease to be tax exempt once estate administration is complete. So that's once the executors have finished processing the estate. Once the account has been closed by the estate, so those monies become taxable again, or three years after death. However, if the deceased has a spouse or civil partner, that person is able to actually contribute even more to their own ISA in that tax year. So they get an extra, extra allowance for the tax year where, <clears throat> where the death takes place. And that extra allowance will be equal to the value of the deceased ISA. So if I passed away with an ISA of £30,000, my spouse or civil partner would be able to then add another £30,000 to their ISA in that tax year, along with the £20,000 of their own normal allowance. So that's a really important benefit to, to use because it's not automatic. You don't inherit the ISA itself, that still gets sold and dealt with as per the, the will. But that extra allowance needs to be used, um, needs to be uh, used if possible to, to get the best tax benefits. So the five, five ISAs that are currently available, I've excluded the help to buy ISA because that's not available for, for new investors. But it's very similar, as I said, in, in terms of its rules to the lifetime ISA. So we're going to cover off the cash ISA first, then stocks and shares ISA, which you'll sometimes see as S and S ISA, the innovative finance ISA, or IF ISA, lifetime ISA, the LISA, and the junior ISA, which ISA. So a few acronyms in there, um, but those are some of the things that you might see when you're when you're reading up about these different products that are available. Sorry, let's skip through a couple of slides. So the cash ISA. Typically, these are going to be with your bank or building society, very similar to an ordinary cash savings account. It just has a different set of tax rules wrapped around it. Some of the benefits are that it's clearly very low risk, but at the same time, that means it's going to be a very low return. Interest rates are starting to rise, but they're nowhere near the levels of inflation that we're seeing at the moment. And therefore holding too much cash is really seeing your money lose value against inflation over the longer term. Cash ISAs tend to be quite accessible unless you've tied yourself into a fixed term, in which case to get that money out early, you might suffer a penalty or you might just not be able to get it out at all. I'm often asked, what's the point in putting money into a cash ISA when those interest rates are still so low? But it does have its place. It's still suitable for people who have a short term savings need. They might be contributing to their lifetime ISA for their first home and still want to set aside some extra savings to go towards that important deposit. So a cash ISA is probably the right thing to think about contributing to there if you can get a half decent interest rate. It might also be that you just don't want to lose that allowance. You're not quite ready to take the next step to investing, but you want to use your ISA allowance and then possibly consider transferring it to one of these other ISAs in the future. There's often very low, if, if any, real minimum contribution to be made, but it's important just to double check that with the provider before you, before you sign up. And I mentioned on the drawbacks there that there's limited tax benefits, and that's really because of the interest rates being so low. Some people might be better off taking out an ordinary cash savings account and using their savings allowance instead. So a basic rate taxpayer can earn a thousand pounds of interest each year 
before they have to pay tax on it. And a higher rate taxpayer, that allowance is halved to £500. So again, you can have quite a high level of cash savings before it actually becomes taxable. Moving on then to the stocks and shares ISA. So the principles are very much similar. The tax rules are the same, the contribution rules are the same, but you have the benefit of potentially higher returns. However, with those potentially higher returns, you get volatility. So you can't expect a very steady, stable rate of growth. You might lose money at times, and you might make money at other times. But importantly here, you as the investor into a stocks and shares ISA are the one that chooses the level of risk that you take. So there's a really wide spectrum of risk and all sorts of different investments that can sit within a stocks and shares ISA. And many people will choose to seek advice on that. Generally, these ISAs still remain fairly flexible and accessible, though, of course, that's subject to the value at the time. If the stock market has fallen and your ISA has fallen in value, you might not be able to get back everything that you've put into it if you want to withdraw the full amount. Uh, there's also a lot of choice. So there's a huge number of potential investments that you can put your, your stocks and shares ISA money into. And that can be a little bit daunting, but at the same time, it means there's a huge opportunity for, for you to pick something that's really right for you. Now, despite there being a really wide range of risk levels available, even the low risk investments can lose money. And it's important to remember that. So cash is always important for a short term need. A stocks and shares ISA might be more appropriate if you've got at least three years to invest your money. And even then, you still have to be happy with the risk that the value will be going up, down as well as up. Unlike a cash ISA, there'll typically be charges for your ISA to be managed, whether you use uh, an online ISA provider um, or through a financial advisor, then there are likely to be ongoing charges that you'll see applied to that ISA each year. Next, the innovative finance ISA. So these are very different again. So innovative finance ISAs or IF ISAs are formed from loans. And these loans are typically peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer loans on platforms where somebody, a business, individual is looking to raise finance. Uh, that finance comes from the investors. So investors like you and I, our money, we get to choose then uh, what loans that money gets invested into. And in return for taking that risk, we receive an interest back for our money. Unlike stocks and shares, which are a bit more volatile, peer-to-peer -peer loans within the ISA are generally more stable because there's a fixed rate of interest being paid. So when you're researching these ISAs, you will more often than not, see that as a, an expected return or potential return figures are provided to you. Again, they can be fairly accessible, though this is really reliant on the on, on the provider that you you invest your money with. So it's important to check if you think you're going to want to withdraw out of the account that the provider is able to facilitate those uh, in the way that you would expect. So uh, if you if you want the ability to take your money out within a set period of time, you just want to ask the question to make sure that that's possible. Quite often, uh, it's not a this ISA or that ISA decision to make. Um, and these innovative finance ISAs are very different to cash ISAs. They're very different to stocks and shares ISAs, and all three can complement each other very well. They all invest into very different assets and all perform very differently. So what you might find is a benefit to you, if you have a large ISA savings already, some people will take some of that money and move it into an innovative finance ISA to get a bit of diversification, just to help uh, spread their risk. Uh, and make sure that not 
not all of their money is in one place. The charges for these types of products typically come out of the gross interest that a borrower is paying. So the money that you receive in your account is often the money that you keep. But again, it's important to understand with stocks and shares and innovative finance ISAs what that charging structure is. And for extra security, loans are often asset backed. And what I mean by that is that they might have a charge on a property or other fixed asset so that if the borrower does default on that borrowing, then there's an asset that the managers of the ISA can take over to help protect your capital. There are drawbacks. And one being that it's a single asset type. So again, this is where diversification becomes important. It's making sure that within that ISA account, your, your savings, your capital, is spread across, across a wide range of loans. And although you will see a more stable, steady interest rate being paid to you, capital is still at risk. It's not a cash ISA. It is an asset, it is loans, and there is risk that you could lose money in the same way that you could lose money with stocks and shares. It focuses on producing an income, no capital growth. Now, that's not necessarily a downside. It's just a consideration to make as to how you deal with that income, whether you reinvest it or whether you have that income out paid to you as an income. And you might do that in retirement to support pension income or other sources of income. And returns are reliant on the borrower's ability to make repayments. So at times, if somebody is behind on payments, then you might not be able to access all of your funds. So an important question when looking into these ISAs is to ask, you know, what's the liquidity of the portfolio? Uh, how easy is it to get your money back out? And <clears throat> what's the track record of your provider or the portfolio that the provider is offering in terms of defaults? And what you're looking for is clearly something that's very low, um, a low track record of any issues with, with, with liquidity. Lifetime ISAs. These are quite restrictive. Um, a lot of people invest into lifetime ISAs because of the government bonus that's applied. Uh, without thinking too much more into it than that. But first, I think it's important to, to understand really that these are for people aged between 18 and 50. Though you can actually only take out a lifetime ISA up until the age of 39. So 18 to 39 to take a lifetime ISA out and up to age 50 for contributions to continue, at which point they must then stop. Your contributions are restricted to £4,000 a year. The government bonus of 25% will top that up to, to £5,000. They're fairly flexible in terms of how they can be invested. So again, it's cash or stocks and shares. Uh, and most, most lifetime ISAs so far are being used for purchasing first, first properties. So they're there for the house deposits. So relatively short term savings. The secondary use of these, as I mentioned earlier on, is for retirement. Um, now, the government bonus still applies. You can contribute up until age 50, but then you cannot access the money until age 60. If you were to access earlier than that and you haven't used it for a house purchase, then you lose the government bonus and there's also a 25% penalty on the capital. So you're possibly going to get back less than you've actually put into the IC yourself. And it's really important to rem remember that. Fantastic to support first time buyers. Equally, they're also good if you invest into them on the understanding that they're for retirement. And that they can possibly support an early retirement. So you might access the lifetime ISA before accessing your pensions, for example. The marketplace is quite limited. 
Now, since these ISAs were introduced, they had a really, really slow uptake with, with ISA providers. And at the moment, there's uh, seven, I believe there's still only seven stocks and shares, uh, lifetime ISA providers, and only five that provide cash, cash ISAs. So it's a very small marketplace, much smaller than, than the wider cash stocks and shares market. Junior ISIS now, a little less relevant possibly for for people on 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 the session today for their own money. But what I quite often see as a financial planner is parents or grandparents using up their ISA allowances first. They've been paying money into their own pensions and at the point that actually they've become uh, very financially secure themselves, they might want to start thinking about supporting the next generation. It might be to help with university fees or even for that house deposit and they're looking for a way that they can do that uh, tax efficiently and in a way that they can keep control of those savings until the child uh, becomes an adult. The junior ISA is really good for that. Um, the annual allowance is capped at £9,000, so that's the amount that you can contribute each year. Again, it can be cash or stocks and shares. So as mentioned before, the consideration there is, is it going to be a short term savings pot or is it going to be three, five or more years? In which case then you might want to consider stocks and shares. A benefit and a downside is that the money is locked in until age 18. So it's a benefit because it means that the child doesn't have access to it and can't spend it. And equally, parents can't have the money back out to spend it. But it's also a drawback because once they are 18, that money becomes theirs. They have control and they can withdraw the whole thing if they wish to. At that point, the parent has no control over how that money is spent or how the savings uh, are managed. And at 18, it just ceases to be a junior ISA and, and becomes a, an ordinary cash ISA or stocks and shares ISA. This allowance unlike the lifetime ISA, is in addition to your own 20,000. So if two parents have already contributed 20,000 each to, to their own ISAs, that's 40,000, they can put another nine into each of their children's ISAs. And again, all the same tax benefits apply. So a fairly simple ISA, but has its own unique uses to support the next generation. I'm again quite often asked by clients about the financial services compensation scheme uh, and how it applies to ISAs. People are very familiar with the scheme when it comes to their cash savings and that directly relates to cash ISAs as well, but a little bit more uns uncertain about how it applies to, to the other ISAs such as stocks and shares and actually what the financial services compensation scheme is, is protecting. So the FSCS aims to protect you if the firm that you're using goes out of business, cannot themselves compensate you uh, in the event of a claim. So your ISA provider goes out of business, you've put a complaint in, uh, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme steps in. What it importantly doesn't protect you against is a poor investment return. So if the bank fails, your cash is protected, um, if the interest rate drops, you're, you're not protected. Same applies then to stocks and shares, uh, to uh, the peer-to-peer -peer loans in the innovative finance ISA or the, the lifetime ISA. In that if the manager fails, you may have some protection depending on the ISA type. But if the investment performs poorly, say your stocks and shares portfolio drops by 20%, then you're not covered there. Cash is protected up to £85,000 per institution, and that's also per person. So a couple can have £85,000 each with Lloyd's, for example. Um, that then, if you have investments with uh, or ICES with different companies, that protection will be with each company that you have money with. 
investments, so stocks and shares, are also now protected up to £85,000. Before March 2019, it was actually at a lower level of, of 50,000. So those have been equalised. An important consideration is that cash, stocks and shares, lifetime ICES and junior ICES are covered by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. But remembering it's only actually if the firm itself goes out of business. Innovative finance ICES are not covered by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So just something to bear in mind. That's uh, that's my brief overview of, of ICES. Um, I'm sure we may have some questions out there. I'm going to hand back to, to Nicola. Uh, so Nicola, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Adam, for a really simple and very helpful breakdown of the ISA options for investors. Um, as you know, we at Folk to Folk, we have an, an innovative finance ISA, an IF ISA available for our investors, which, as you mentioned, is um, one of the newer ISA options. And I must say, we've been really pleased with the take up of our IF ISA. Um, and I think we've got more than 46 million actually invested um, via our platform to date. Anyway, I think now's time perhaps to open up to the floor for any questions. And um, I'm going to hand back to Varian to see um, what questions we've had that have come in. So thanks, Varian. Thanks, Nicola. And thank you, Adam, for a really great um, and easy to ingest overview of ISAs. So we're really grateful for that. And we have had several questions that were, that were submitted in advance and actually quite a bit of it you've covered in your very comprehensive um, presentation there. But I think it's worth just asking them just to make sure that the people who asked them have had a full enough answer to it. Um, I mean, the first the first cab off the rank is actually are ISAs covered by the FSCS, which is the last thing you mentioned, really. So perhaps just worth recapping there that very clear distinction you made about what the FSCS actually does cover. Of course, and I think that's a a, a really important point. The, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme FSCS is only covering you in the event that a firm actually goes bust or isn't able to, to meet its compensation for you in the event of a claim. So uh, it, it's not there to provide against uh, a poor investment return, as I mentioned. Um, the important distinction between ISAs is just that uh, the innovative finance ISA isn't covered by the, by the FSCS. It may be in the future, but as it stands, it isn't. Um, ho ho hopefully there's enough detail there, there on that. Yes, that's really helpful. Thank you, Adam. Um, this is a good question here. What do I look for when choosing an ISA provider? That's a really interesting question, um, and it's a bit of a tricky one. Uh, I mean, my, my job day to day is to help people find find the right right solutions to these things. Um, but if I were to give a bit of guidance on on sort of doing it yourself, then once you've decided which of those ISAs are, are the right solution for you, when you're looking at the providers, some, some important considerations are clearly cost. So how much is it going to cost you to invest with that manager? What are the minimum contributions? So some providers, there will be no minimums. Others, it might be five, ten, twenty thousand pounds and if you're contributing £20,000, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but when you look to top it up further in a future year, you might just want to check that there's flexibility to, to add a, a smaller amount in um, than your initial contribution. You need to look at the manager's track record. So this is more relevant for stocks and shares ISOs and innovative finance ISOs. Uh, how does your money get invested? Is it down to you as the investor to choose what in investments you ultimately pick and invest in? Or will the manager uh, create a portfolio for you? And by track record, you want to look at performance record. Does that meet your own expectations? How volatile has it been? 
Uh, and with something like an innovative finance ISA, as I mentioned earlier on in, in the session, how how accessible is, is the money and are there any any uh, issues in the track record around around liquidity and actually getting money back out? Because for for yourself as an investor, it's important that your your product and the underlying investments meet your own needs. So firstly, understanding what those needs are and then find the right solution to to, to fit with it. Does, does that answer the, the, the question? Hopefully. Yes, I think it does. Thank you. Um, just uh, going to one of the questions that's just come in uh, on our screen from Eric, which says, what happens at the end of an if ISA period? Are money still protected in an ISA wrap? Yes, is uh, my, my short answer to that. So ordinarily, if you've got an ISA of any kind with a, a term attached to it, when it comes to the end of that term, be it a cash product, innovative finance or, or, or any other kind of fixed term, it won't cease to be an ISA. Um, you may be given a time period to make a decision by whether you want to reinvest, uh, transfer to another manager, or withdraw your funds, um, but it won't just automatically cease to be an ISA. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, there's a question here about transferring ISAs. You've you've mentioned that earlier in your presentation. Um, how easy is it to actually do that? It's it's very easy. Um, so. Uh, unlike sometimes when we're trying to switch bank accounts or, or set up new accounts, it's actually very straightforward. So, so typically you would you would take out your new ISA, you'd create, you'd uh, complete your application with the new manager, and as part of that, they will ask for details of anything that you want to transfer in. Um, often that's all that's needed, uh, but sometimes your your existing ISA provider will want a form completed. Um, and that will be a very straightforward form that just details where you'd like the money transferred to. So it it should be very simple. Thank you, Adam. And um, yeah, that's what we've seen from from our side for sure. Um, a question here, which um, I'm not surprised to to have received, um, is is there such a thing as an ethical ISA? Yes, that's a. Uh, that's that's a that's another really interesting one. Um, yes, there are ethical ethical ISA options, um, and a lot more prominent uh, in recent years is something called ESG or environmental, social, and, and, and governance investing, which is very similar to to the sort of traditional ethical approach. Now, I'm going to try and break this down to the different ISA types, perhaps. Um, so with a cash ISA, um, what does ethical mean with cash? Well, you might just want to choose an institution, a bank or building society that uh, is is uh, is in line with with your own beliefs on on what ethical means to you. With with stocks and shares, it becomes a bit more detailed. Um, there are very specific ethical investments or ESG investments that you can put your money into that avoid certain industries or investing into companies that are trying to do some good for the for the planet. So green energy, healthcare, all sorts of different themes available. Um, with an innovative finance ISA, you might want to pick loans for your portfolio that are supporting companies that again are, are trying to do the right thing and are a bit more, more green perhaps. Um, and you have a bit of control over over who you're actually providing your your money to. Um, so yes, there are, but it, it can be a little bit of a minefield. OK, thank you. Just two final questions now. Um, one again is something that you've already covered, but I do like to ask it again to make sure that the person who asked it's got, got the fuller answer as possible. And it's what happens to my ISA if I die? How is an ISA allowance inherited? So maybe the, maybe the angle here is a bit more around the how it's inherited. Yeah, of course. So an ISA itself isn't inherited, um, but the, the allowance is and it needs to be claimed. 
So <clears throat> a spouse is able to claim that allowance, but effectively you need evidence of the ISA that was there um, and the value at death, which you'll have by going through probate anyway. Um, so effectively you can contribute that money then to any type of ISA that you like. So it doesn't matter if it's spouse or partner had a cash ISA, stocks and shares, innovative finance, regardless of what it was, what's important is the value of it at death. That is then the amount that, that you'll effectively contribute as a special allowance to, to the ISA of your choice. Um, an important consideration, I, I know I mentioned inheritance tax. Uh, it will form part of the estate. Now, there are, with, without sort of complicating it too much, there, there are some ISAs available which will also qualify for inheritance tax relief. And I know that's not quite the question being asked, um, but it's worthwhile noting, I think, since we're on, that, on the subject of, of inheriting ISAs, that actually you can convert uh, an ISA into a version of a stocks and shares ISA that does qualify for inheritance tax relief, though it does have to have been held for, for two years. So there, there's, there's again a lot of detail around that whole, that whole subject and I think if somebody is concerned about um, inheriting an ISA then the best way to do it, the one recommendation I would make is to, when the event has happened, speak directly to the existing ISA provider, so that of the deceased and the person inheriting, um, and equally to speak to um, a, an IFA uh, to give you a bit of guidance at, at the time. OK, thank you, Adam. I think we've we've covered that one well now. And our final question is around the innovative finance ISA, the IF ISA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing more and more about IF ISAs. Why are they suddenly becoming more popular? Uh, very good question. I think there's there's a few reasons for that. Um, one, one thing we've seen when any new ISA is launched is that it takes a little while to get itself off the ground. Um, Perhaps Nicola has some details on the amounts that that are sort of have, have flown into to, to to your own ISAs and how that's grown. But one of the things that that I've seen is there's just a lot more awareness, um, and as that builds up, as more providers come into the marketplace, it starts to become more popular with with savers. Also, we've got this big burden at the moment of inflation. Um, inflation is so high. Uh, the traditional sort of cash ISA investor is really looking for alternative ways to get to get stable returns. Uh, you might not want to put those those valuable savings into a stocks and shares ISA where the value is going to be going up and down quite a lot. An innovative finance ISA offers something a bit different. It does offer a bit more stability or a more predictable return similar to, to cash in that you, you, you've got a good handle on what interest you're going to earn. Um, and I think it's a combination of those things really, those sort of inflationary pressures, low interest rates, um, all, all supporting the innovative finance ISA. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Good answer. I think we're we're seeing that on on our side with um, an increase in transfers of of ISAs from cash and stocks and shares ISAs mm. in particular, and it's interesting to see to see where that's coming from. But um, I'm going to hand back to Nicola now. That's the end of our questions for today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Varian, and thank you again, Adam, for a very very informative session. Um, that's the end of our webinar today. A recording will be sent out to all our participants. Um, but for now, thank you for your time. And from all of us, goodbye.